If these five Bible passages apply to you, this is a good sign God is calling you to pursue marriage. Number one, if the only reason you're remaining single is religious duty, 1 Timothy 4 verses 1 through 5 say that you should pursue marriage. Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. One sign of unhealthy man-made religious rules is restrictions. In the Bible, there certainly are rules where God says don't do this certain thing that it seems like a restriction, but the Bible's rules are actually there to protect us and help us follow Christ more sincerely, which leads to more joy. Man-made religious rules don't accomplish this healthy purpose. Rather, they're restricting and they hinder us from enjoying the freedom that we have in Christ. For example, when a religious idea comes up that says you shouldn't be married because this somehow makes God happy, as we just saw in this passage, that's a religious man-made idea that's restricting us from enjoying the good gift of marriage if that's something God has put on your heart. So if the only reason you're not pursuing marriage is because you've been falsely taught this wrong idea that marriage should be forbidden out of religious duty, 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 5 is encouraging you to pursue marriage so you can enjoy this gift as God intends. Number two, if a commitment to singleness is tempting you to compromise on your commitment to Christ, 1 Timothy 5 verses 9 through 12 say that you should pursue marriage. Let a widow be enrolled if she is not less than 60 years of age, having been the wife of one husband and having a reputation for good works. If she has brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, has cared for the afflicted, and has devoted herself to every good work, but refused to enroll younger widows. For when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry, and so incur condemnation for having abandoned their former faith. While this passage is specifically talking about widows, it certainly does lay out a principle that's very helpful to all singles. In context, Paul was giving the church information on how to properly care for widows. He said older widows who have already raised a family, they've already have children, they've already accomplished a lot of those things they wanted to accomplish when they were younger, it's healthy to financially support those widows if they don't have any family members to support them because they're not going to be tempted again to pursue marriage and pursue a relationship even though they've committed to singleness. On the other hand, a younger widow would be tempted to sin in singleness if she's being financially supported by the church as a widow because she would have divided interests. She would want to be financially supported still as a widow, so she would not want to get married, but her inner desires would be to have another relationship. And therefore, instead of just pursuing marriage in a healthy way, she would remain single and be tempted to pursue relationships in a sinful way in singleness. Again, rather than just doing it the holy way and pursuing marriage. All that to say, Paul laid out a principle here that singles should only pursue singleness and not marriage if they are going to be content being single. If you grow bitter and you're going to be mad about pursuing singleness, then this passage in the Bible is saying that you should pursue marriage. We'll talk more about this theme in point four of this video. Number three, if neglecting the ministry of marriage will lead you into idleness, 1 Timothy 5, 13 through 15 says you should pursue marriage. Besides that, younger widows learn to be idlers, going about from house to house, and not only idlers, 
but also gossips and busybodies, saying what they should not. So I would have younger widows marry, bear children, manage their households, and give the adversary no occasion for slander, for some have already strayed after Satan. Again, this passage is specifically about widows, but it lays out an important principle that's relevant for all Christian singles. Marriage certainly isn't the only ministry in life, but it is an important ministry that God calls many people to do. And throughout the Bible, it's very clear that it's good to stay busy doing ministry. Otherwise, idleness leads to sin. Therefore, if your singleness is causing you to be idle, while you could be in the ministry of marriage, staying busy doing good things for the glory of God, this is a good sign that God is calling you to marriage. Additionally, when you read 1 Corinthians 7, it's clear that Paul isn't advocating singleness for everyone or marriage for everyone. Rather, he is giving us a grid to make this choice based upon which lifestyle will most equip us as individuals to serve God in the most effective way possible. So in that passage, if singleness is what will lead someone to focus more on Christ, then Paul says you should be single. If you are struggling in singleness and this is hurting your walk with God rather than helping it, you should pursue marriage. Do whichever one is going to equip you to serve God to the best of your ability. Number four, if remaining single is not a joyful sacrifice you are happy and willing to make, 1 Corinthians 7 verse 36 says you should pursue marriage. If anyone thinks that he is not behaving properly toward his betrothed, if his passions are strong and it has to be, let him do as he wishes. Let them marry. It is no sin. When it comes to sacrifice, God certainly does call us to do things that sometimes we don't want to do, but we know God wants us to do. But when you really study the heart of sacrifice in scripture, it's very clear that God loves a cheerful giver. In other words, God wants our sacrifice to be joyfully given. So if singleness is a sacrifice you're not willing and happy to give, then this isn't pleasing to God. As 2 Corinthians 9, 7 through 8 explains, each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. When God calls you to make a sacrifice, he will give you the grace to do this sacrifice in a joyful way. So it's entirely possible that if you lack the joy and willingness to make a particular sacrifice, God may not be calling you to make that sacrifice. For example, when Paul talks about singleness, it's really clear that he enjoyed singleness and he was happy to make this sacrifice. And it was a sacrifice. As Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 9 verse 5, Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Paul willingly sacrificed his right to have a wife so he could focus on other ministry efforts. Cephas, meaning Peter, and the other apostles chose to embrace the ministry of marriage. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 7, Paul also wrote, I wish that all were as I myself am, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. Paul was talking about his singleness here. Paul enjoyed his singleness and wanted others to have the same joy as him, but he also knew God made us all different. Some of us would not be joyful to be single. Thus, Paul knew God gave others the gift of marriage. In 1 Corinthians 7 verses 39 through 40, Paul concludes, A wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives, but if her husband dies, she is free to be married to whom she wishes, only in the Lord. Yet in my judgment, she is happier if she remains as she is. And I think that I too have the Spirit of God. Again, from Paul's personal viewpoint, he felt singleness would lead to more happiness but he obviously also recognized God gave other people other gifts. Notice, however, that Paul's decision-making process about singleness or marriage involved deciding which one would make you happier. Therefore, if you are not happy to be single, these passages are saying you should pursue marriage. And number five, if you have a strong sexual desire that you struggle to control, 
1 Corinthians 7 verses 2 through 9 say that you should pursue marriage. But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. No matter if you're single or married, God calls us all to control our sexuality and not sin in that area of our lives. We certainly should not pursue marriage just to have sex, but we should also remember that the sexual urges God gave us are not bad in and of themselves, but rather how we use them. The sexual desires, if you have them, are often a sign that God has designed you to express those desires in pure ways. God made sex as an expression of love between a husband and wife in the context of marriage. How will God reveal the one to you? I answer that question in these videos right here in this playlist. I'm Mark from ApplyGodsWord.com. Until next time, God bless.